Hello, this is Sam Gerrans from samgerrans.com. Today's Wednesday, March the 1st, 2023. And today the topic is going to be Putin uh, through the eyes of a Westerner who's lived in Russia for 20 years. Now, this talk is not about whether or not you like Putin. It's not really whether or not about whether or not I like Putin. It's more about uh, who Putin is, who Putin isn't, and uh, this all through the eyes of somebody who's lived in Russia, as I say, for, for some time. Now, um, some of my background, it's not all of my background, but it's a part of it. I happen to have a degree in Russian language and literature. And after my degree, I came to live in Russia. And I've spent, or I should think, about 20, 21 years out of the last 25, 26, 27, 28 years here. I speak Russian. I'm married to a Russian. You know, I deal with Russian life on a daily basis. Um, this doesn't mean that my my point of view on this subject is the only point of view or the only one with any validity, but it is my point of view, and I'm going to share it with you, and you can make of it what you like. So, as I say, this isn't about whether or not one should or should not like Putin. In, in the West, in the Western presentation, it's all very solipsistic. We, it's all about, you know, me, 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 me culture, with what I feel about things, what I like about things, whether, whether reality if insofar as we care about reality anymore uh, comports with what I want with with me and my desires none of this is about that uh, so uh, if you're expecting that uh, you might as well just kind of switch to the Disney Channel this isn't what it is here now if you don't know uh, politics in Russia I mean, you're told in the West uh, that uh, Russia is some sort of autocracy um, it's a stronger form of government than you have in the West uh, in the sense that uh, there is a plan, and um, that plan is talked about. Uh, you have a plan in the West, but that plan is really a covert plan. It's not talked about. Here, things are somewhat different, and there are reasons for the for that. Um, and one of them is cultural. You see, in the West, certainly in the last, and I, I grew up uh, in the UK, so in the 1970s. So it, as the West began to sort of uh, decompose really into its into this uh, kind of mishmash of nonsense. Um, it became very unclear w what the plan was of any kind. Now in Russia, things are very different. Here, uh, it's more of a I would say basically a male culture. Uh, in some regards, uh, in some regards, <laughs> not in all, but but in a lot. Um, and we have a culture here of first of all of there being as it were. In Russian, the word is, is substanik, like an owner, like somebody who is chazayin, who is, who is the, the master. This is uh, a, an accepted concept here. We, we, we're not drowning in the, the feminist um, um, kind of relativistic nonsense, although it is beginning here. It is beginning. I'll get to some of that later on. But it's, it's, it's more like here... It would have been in the UK or in America uh, in the 1940s or 50s, something like that. Okay, so we have a concept here of mushina uh, skazal zdil. It means like a man says he's going to do something, he does it. Okay, I know this is probably going to be triggering all kinds of people in the West. With uh, I don't care, <laughs> I'm this side of the New World Order firewall, so it doesn't really bother me. I'm just telling you how it is here. Okay. And that's the culture that we have. Um, if you've listened to Douglas McGregor, whom I respect greatly, and his, his military uh, um, acumen and knowledge and experience and so, and so on, but he, he, makes, he makes many very good points. But one of the points that he makes, which is absolutely bang on in my opinion, is that modern Russia is far more like uh, Tsarist Russia than it is like the Soviet Union. I mean, the idea of you have to understand that the Soviet Union was a, was basically a coup engineered from outside, pretty much by some of the same uh, interests that are presently trying to destroy Russia this time around, uh, from which Russia has recovered. It's called the Russian Revolution, but there was very little Russian about it. If you look at look at it in any detail, anyway, I'm not there to, here to discuss that specifically. What I do want to say is that politics and popular politics here are, are different to how they are in the West. This is just a fact. Now, I know that if you watch, um, let's say for example, there's a, there's a, a BBC program called Question Time in in the UK, and the poor 
people in the West, they, in, in England anyway, they think that this is some sort of open and free debate. No, 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 not at all. Uh, and th I know this for a fact because Question Time many years ago came to Russia and I was going to attend as a, as, as a sort of a member of the audience. Um, but before you can get in to be a member of the audience, they want to know what your politics are. So this is a pre-vetted audience. This this isn't representative of the British people by any means. And it's it's highly orchestrated and conversations are kind of, they're locked down in, in, in what you can say, what you can't say and all the rest of it. Here, it's, I mean, it is changing a bit. And I have to confess, I don't watch, I don't actually have a television, but I do, I do pick up stuff uh, on the internet every now and then. And I have had a television in Russia in my life and watched some of it, mainly because I wanted it for the language. And political debates, just in case you don't know here, are actually real. I mean, they're real in the sense that they are um, they're impassioned, they're visceral. People say all kinds of crazy stuff that you would never, ever hear a, a Western politician say ever. Now, Putin doesn't get involved in that at that level. But what I'm trying to say is there is an actual debate here. Certainly there is a power structure here, it's as there is in the West, but it, it's a different form. Um, is it possible to 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 criticize that? Sh sure, people criticize all kinds of things, and people criticize them inside Russia too. So the idea that this is some sort of autocracy where you can't speak your mind is just, in my experience at least, false. Because I can speak my mind here far more than they ever could in the West. In fact, the only reason I can speak my mind is because I'm not in the West. You know, the, it's this is the way it works. Is am I saying that Russia is some sort of you know? A wonderful heavenly land where everything, you know, with overflowing with, with milk and honey. No, of course not. Of course not. Um, but on balance, and this is what life is, you have to kind of make choices between usually two sets of things which aren't particularly great. On balance, Russia is a, a far freer country in these terms. Although it's presented in the West as this draconian, um, I don't know, sort of a junta ship with Putin unilaterally deciding everything. I'm not here. I'm not here as, an, as a Putin apologist. I'm just explaining to you that on my in on a day to day level, this 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 presentation is really cartoonish. Um, and to get back to political debates, you can have you see political debates. I mean, unfortunately. Zhirinovsky, God rest his soul, he died, and we really, we really needed him at this time. In he was born for this time. In fact, he he foresaw this time. Uh, I'm not here as an apologist for Zhirinovsky. I know it's difficult, you know, for a lot of Western audiences to understand that somebody can can present ideas that he himself does not is not fully kind of bought. He hasn't fully bought into. But Zhirinovsky, if you don't know who he was, he was a very interesting man, and he's a uh, his almost almost prophecies really to deal to do with what's happening right now. Um, people are only in you know in recent times understanding how you know how prescient he was. You would never get anybody like this in the West. It wouldn't be possible. Just the the, the concept doesn't exist. Um, and I'm not saying this, you know, I don't work for the Russian tourist board or anything. I'm just telling you that this isn't how it is. In the West, when you ask a politician a question, we all understand that it's evasion. It's uh, it's just lies. We, we we know this. We expect it. We understand that it's that. And we'd be surprised if it was anything else. Here, I, I, I mean, am I saying that all Russian politicians are, you know, somehow uh, virtuous and noble all the time? No, I'm not saying that. It'd be ridiculous. What I am saying is that when you ask them a question, um, especially when you ask, I'm just moving the table, when you ask Putin a question, you get an answer. I mean, if you it, let's just compare, for example, uh, Liz Truss, when she was the foreign minister of, of the UK, you ask her a question. And when you ask Sergei Lavrov a question, it's the question, it's the difference between asking, you know, a dinner lady to explain to you, you know, something complicated, and asking a university professor who's prepared on pretty much any subject you ask him about. This is the difference. And in this culture, we expect it. We will put up, a, uh, Russians will put up with a lot. They'll put up with, a, you know, a lot of failures. They'll put up with a lot of, you know, what, what the West would call corruption. Or, but we expect our leaders to lead. We expect them to be impressive. And not all of them are, but, but the one I'm talking about at the moment he is. I mean, as somebody who can listen, I, I don't know Putin personally, I've never met him, but I 
I have a very good sense of who he is because I can I, I listen to him talk. And you see, when somebody asks a question in whatever forum it is, he's relaxed. He's got the facts at his fingertips. Uh, he's not, you know, using these duplicious workarounds. You ask him a question, and he you just he'll answer you. And usually, the time runs out before he runs out of what he's got to say. It isn't Joe Biden. You know, saying, you know, oh, well, come on, man. You know, it's not that. It's, it's we're dealing with people who, in another in another life, probably most of the top, uh, not not all maybe, but many of the top uh, political figures in this country could, on on the basis of a meritocracy, be you know university dons on on all kinds of subjects. That's not the case in the West. In, in, in the West, they're mediocre by design. They have to be mediocre, and they know that. They do know that. And I, I think that the, I'm getting, not going to get into it now, but even the, the those who are afflicted with talent in the West understand that they have to hide that, that, that mediocrity is, what is, the, is the absolutely number one requirement uh, and supine absence of any sort of integrity. Uh, I'm, I'm not being... This isn't invective. This is... This is um, this is analysis. I'm saying that they understand that that's required. That's the requirement to get ahead in the West. It's not the same here. We expect Russians. We expect somebody who can, who's impressive. Okay, and we don't have. We do have this concept of narod. Now, narod is a little bit different to people because people, at least in my understanding of the English language, people is a sort of agglomeration of individuals. Okay, people. Like we have person, people, okay? In, in Russia, we have the concept of narod. Now, narod is like a mass, a mass of people. It's not any individual. It's it's almost like a block, almost like the union, you know, kind of group consciousness thing. That we have here. So we do have a collective notion, but the collective here requires a leader. And if you want to call that autocracy, okay, call it autocracy. But what we don't have so much here... Um, well, there is a sort of a group think. There is a sort of a group think, but it, it, it's not exactly the same as it is in the West. Anyway, I'm going to get on to another subject because I'll be here all day. So what Putin says is directly connected with what he does. Now, this is going to be a difficult concept to get if you're from the West because of how you've been trained, how you've, what your experience has shown you. You know that every time a, um, a politician opens his mouth, he's 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 evading something. He's he, because he doesn't really make any decisions himself. What he is <clears throat> is a weather vane, able to pick up what's going on around him, and then gush along in the same direction whilst simulating leadership. That's 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 the, the, the long and the short of it. Now, sure, Putin's a, a politician, so he has to be aware of certain tendencies. But for the reasons that I've given you, he's, he's expected to have a worldview. He's expected to lead, actually lead. Do you remember leaders, actual leaders, not not pretend leaders, not influencer leaders, not TikTok leaders, but actual leaders? Well, that's his job. And and as far as I can see, you only have one in Europe, uh, maybe one and a half. Uh, Orban. There is nobody else in Europe who who meets the criteria in from the Russian perspective of a leader. And it's not just because Orban is closer to Russia. It's because he actually leads. He actually has a, a point of view that is related to his own people. Uh, he hasn't sold them out <laughs> and all of that. But but he does. He actually leads insofar as he can within within you know given parameters. So certainly uh, Putin is a politician. This this point is missed in the West. Um, he's, he's presented as an autocrat. Um, Certainly there's an element, as I've said, uh, which is closer to the Tsarist notion. You see, under Tsarist Russia, this huge country, there was always the idea that although things may be bad, although things may be you know, unfair here or there, if only the Tsar knew about this, it would all be solved. You see, the kind of the father of the nation. We have this concept here, and I think this is completely lost. And Russians, I'm not saying all Russians, I'm not saying all Russians, you can't say all Russians because Russians, you know, it's 146 million people, a lot of, you know, and, and then they're, they're very unruly and, you know, they're all very, you know, they've all got their opinions about things. But as a generalization, at least from where I'm standing, we tend to, we incline towards this. Okay, we're not threatened by it, we want it. 
we want a strong leader because we we understand here this isn't this isn't America where they've never had anything bad really happen to them and, until very very recently or you know England where no one has really suffered since World War II you know in this country we've had suffering <laughs> we've kind of suffered that's what we do here um, when people talk about uh, the crisis in 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 Russia, we just you know our, our crises kind of dovetail one into another, so that it's not that having no crisis is the norm. Crisis is the norm. In fact, one could argue that Russians rather like crises. It, 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 it's a it's a bit of a kind of a, a going off into it on, on a tangent. But my view is that Russia, as a huge country, they're, they're, everyone here is really um, subconsciously. In, wants some sort of hug you know they have this physical physicality here so the way that people drive is it's all about trying to get as close to your car as possible <laughs> um or the russians very much like cramming themselves into the tiny spaces and and sort of pushing each other around i, th I think it kind of i think it, the, what the russians are looking for if in the west if in northern europe what we're looking for is the horizon okay we're always edging toward the horizon. See, in, in Russia, there's the forest. The forest is overhanging, overcast, dark space. It was, it was likewise huge and dangerous, but it's a different kind of concept. And so Russians have got this kind of, this need, in my view at least, to huddle together. It's, and you see it on the metro. Uh, you, see, you, see, you see it on the, you know, you see it, you see it, Russian Orthodox Church, I don't personally like them, okay? It doesn't appeal to me in the slightest. But if you go to them, it's not like if you go into a Catholic church or a Protestant church in the West where you have pews and you sit down. There are There is no sitting down space. It's more like a rugby scrum with candles. Anyway, I'm going off on a tangent here. Let's get back to Putin. So Putin, sure, he's a politician. He has an agenda. Certainly has these things. But he is a lawyer. If you watch him, he operates like a lawyer. And, and the, the presentation of Putin in the West is of this, you know, well, it's varied, but he's become he's become 1984's Goldstein. You know, he's 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 the epitome of evil, every evil, and he's responsible for everything bad that happens. My argument would be, well, why don't you just make him president of all of your countries then, seeing as he has so much power? But he he really isn't like this at all. And if you watch him, uh, uh, he has faults. Certainly, he's got absolutely no aesthetic taste whatsoever. But he has a sense of humour of a kind. He has a, has a very highly developed sense of humour and he allows it. This comes across. So the Russian people, and I'm, you know, I'm not here as a spokesman for all Russian people. I'm here as a spokesman for myself, as somebody who spent a lot of time here and spent a lot of time learning the language, reading the literature, reading history and so on. So from, from that point of view, I, my view is that Russians have a highly developed sense of humour and... Uh, you kind of need one to, to live here. In fact, you're expected to have one if you live here. Putin has one too. And it's not a kind of laugh out loud kind of humor, but it's certainly, it's a type of irony. And none of this comes across in the West at all. Okay, so this, this isn't this isn't Putin fanboy stuff. It's nothing to do with this. I'll just make this point again. That's not what I'm saying. I'm describing, as it were, I'm, it's almost like I'm I'm, uh, like a travel uh, narrator. narrator. I'm, I'm just explaining where I've been. I'm not saying that this is the only country one should live in or that everything there is wonderful. I'm just explaining that this is what it is actually like in the experience of somebody who's lived here a long time. Okay? All right, let's move on to the next one. Yeah, the next point is that Putin is a moderate. This is completely elided from the narrative in the West. P Putin is this, you know, madman, this insane person, etc., I mean, maybe that's true. I, 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 it's not my perception, but l l let's leave that to one side. But what is what is beyond uh, contention is the fact that he is a moderate, given the political atmosphere in this country. Many people in this country are frustrated with Putin for not for for taking so long to do what he's what he's done. He's his instincts always are to, if you want to use the word err, to or at least to incline towards um, reticence, towards not making sudden moves. He's a cautious man. He's a moderate. And I know this doesn't come across at all in the West, but, but it is true. Um, all right, so let's move on to the next bit. 
Yes. To follow on from that, he's, in my view, he's an incremental person. He understands. Uh, we have an expression, "Tisha Yiddish dalshe budish," and it, it translates right roughly as "the quieter you walk, the further you get." And I would say this is true of Putin. He's not. He's not Yeltsin. He's not. You know, Lenin. He's not one. He's more like a. He's more like a tsar. You know, he's more like somebody who understands that he's here for the long term. This isn't just about, you know, huge five-year plans and, you know, big impressive stuff. It's about it's about building building something that's going to last. So that, that's the way I, I perceive him. Am I saying he has no failings? No, that's not my argument. Am I saying, you know, under certain, you know, is he this, is he that? That's not my argument. I'm just telling you how I see it somebody who lives there lives here so there you are so that's that bit okay so let's get on to the next bit do all russians love putin okay <laughs> um no of course not however i would say he's he's uh, you know this is if you like democracy if you believe in it if it's something that appeals to your emotionality fine happy you i think it's complete nonsense myself personally but but let's say it's you know let's it's 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 uh the most popular um story okay so all right let's let's stick with that is russia a democracy it depends what you mean by democracy because democracy is a moving target it depends you know on who's speaking and what they want to achieve um but okay if we i don't know what your definition is um i'm not going to get into my view on this but people vote here and they have a free vote and the votes are counted and as far as I can see, there's no corruption in that. I mean, you know, in that process. So if that's your definition of a democracy, it's democracy. Um, certainly Putin is wildly popular um, amongst most people in this country at this time, I would say. Now, there are some, um, there are some exceptions, of course, that, and I'll get into them. Um, but what I will say at this time, and this is, again, this is anecdotal, this is my view, this is what I get from living here. So, I mean, you would perhaps be interested in the view of somebody who had been, let's say, to Australia, and, you know, 400 years ago, and you'd never been there. Does it mean it's the definitive view of Australia? No, it doesn't. It, but it means this person has been there and lived there, and, you know, their point of view, uh, no matter what you might read written by others, has some sort of relevance to, to the facts on the ground. So what I... What I do think is that most normal Russians, and I'm going to get into what I mean by unnormal Russians, and they definitely exist, uh, is that they understand viscerally a few basic truths. And the first of these is that, now particularly, and the first of these is that the West is completely untrustworthy. This has been proven beyond any any doubt. Uh, I'll just give you an example. I mean, IKEA who had who was basically the mainstay of all um, furniture sales in in Russia just up to up to the left i call them ikea not here um, because they're not here anymore they've just gone and so it's it, okay companies can choose to leave if they wish if they wish to leave you know go ahead knock yourself out but my point is this they reneged on all of their contractual obligations, warranties, guarantees, everything. It's not just IKEA. They all did. They all all of the Western companies did this. So after coming in after the, you know, after after the collapse of the Soviet Union, uh, really as proselytes of of the capitalist gospel or the free market gospel. And I think Russians were impressed by this. I mean they'd been they'd lost. You know, the Soviet Union had lost in the war of ideas. And so it's natural to be on the back foot and to take this all very seriously. Although I do remember being told once by a girl this many years ago, she uh, when I first came to Russia many many years ago, I taught English as many people do, and I taught English at Coca Cola, um, in Sultsova, I think it was, just outside Moscow, and there was a, a girl there. I mean, these were all you know, these were all young executives, and she said to me, she said the difference between the West and 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 this many many years ago, this you know, really, I suspect that the kind of back end of the nineteen nineties, she said the difference between the West and Russia was quite interesting she said in uh, yeah when when americans watch films where they're all hitting each other and punching each other and driving around at 300 miles an hour they all know it's not true they know it's fiction they know it's nonsense she said but for us when we watched that we thought that people in america really drove like that we thought that that this was real to some extent um whereas 
when Americans talk about five-year plans and stuff, they take it all seriously. She said when the Americans came to to to, to Russia and started talk, telling us about their, you know, their their plans and their projections and all this, Russia are like, oh, we've had this for the last seventy years. <laughs> they all knew it was complete nonsense. So I just thought that that little sort of internal dichotomy was quite interesting. Um, that's all changed. We we now know in Russia we know that the West's words mean nothing. And so although the West initially won the war of ideas, the capital that it gained from that is completely spent now. It's completely spent. It's not so much that people hate the West. It's not that. It's just, it's a bit like, um, you know, if you have a have a relative who is an alcoholic and you've been denying it in your mind, you, you wish it weren't true because let's say he was very kind to you when you were a child or, or whatever it was. I mean, the parallel kind of breaks down at some point here, but... But in this case, but there comes a point where, you know, he's stolen your wallet and he's attacked your girlfriend and burnt your house down. And he's an alcoholic. He's he's beyond help. We now have to treat this individual uh, accordingly. And that's where we are, I think, here. We understand. And I th I'm not speaking again for all Russians. I'm talking uh, from my experience of my engagement with Russians. This is how I see it. That what the West is... Um, undeniably um, unhinged and our main problem is how to manage your insanity that's it I would say that's pretty much it and any kind of sense of um, in some way being impressed by or cowed by the the the, 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 the I don't know sort of almost you know amazingness of Western, you know, the luster of Western power, that's all gone. There's only one way to deal with you lot, and it's with a great big stick. And and and, and then we'll then we'll see. Okay. And and I think Russians are almost embarrassed. I, in my sense, is that they're embarrassed that they took it all so seriously that they really thought it was real. Of course, I knew it wasn't real because I'd grown up there. I knew it was complete nonsense. I've been trying for years to tell people, but now everyone's kind of caught up a little bit so the second bit is that the west is morally corrupt well again you know i came here to get away from some of this uh, degeneration which is something i'll talk about in other in other shows but with my russian friends i've tried for years to explain to them that the pedophile agenda in the west that we, we living in, in the UK, because we lived in the UK for a couple of years, we basically had to escape the UK with, with our then five-year-old, four-year-old daughter. I didn't, didn't tell the nursery we were leaving. The nursery was intimidating. You know, you could see that they were watching you, you know, because they didn't like the cut of our jib, because I noticed things like they had uh, books in the nursery, you know, how, how, you know, how wonderful it was. Me, me and my two daddies pushing this filth. Because I studied Soviet history, I recognized from what, f them for what they were, members of the party. You could see, you know, junior members of the party, you could see they were just looking, waiting, waiting to grass you up to the social services. So we literally left. We literally ran away from the UK. I didn't tell them we were leaving. I didn't tell them anything until we were safely out of the country. And even then, I didn't tell them where we'd gone. I mean, it was like that. You, you have to escape that kind of insanity. Now, am I saying it's perfect here? No, I'm not. And I'll get into some of that maybe in other in other programs. But the the fact is is that you know, our considerations for our daughter. I don't want to grow up in a paedophile infested ins insane asylum. You know, meant that I couldn't live in my own country. There you are. All right. So the but yes, back to my point. I would try to t I, years ago. I would try to tell Russians about how nuts it is in the West, how totally unhinged from reality, where men can decide to be a woman and vice versa. And they'd kind of look at me. I'd, I'd see them. And I, you'd, after a couple of minutes, you'd see them kind of glaze over. And I could, you can see them thinking, you know what? They don't believe me. They think I'm exaggerating. Not anymore. Not anymore. They know now. I, I, we don't have to have this conversation, thankfully. And and the, the next thing, which I think that most Russians have finally got, finally, 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 it's, you know, the, the, the pennies dropped, is that the West will not stop until Russia is destroyed. We understand that this is the agenda. I'm not saying all Russians see it this way, but I think a, a lot do. And so what's going on here is uh, essentially it's a, 
an existential fight. This isn't Russia invaded Ukraine. No, this is Russia fighting for its survival. And if you know even a little bit about Russia's history over the last thousand years, then you know that Russia is very good, has an excellent track record of fighting for its survival. It's not so great at producing cars you'd want to drive, but fighting for its survival is something that it, you, 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 know, you can criticise Russia on a lot of fronts, but this is something that I think is, is an area in which it's beyond reproach. So this is existential for Russia, and I think now people have finally understood that. Okay, so let's move on. Um, yes, we certainly have what I would call a tarred class here, a libtard class. And I'm going to get into this in, in further talks. You know, I'd like to get into the ideas of people like Jacques Silul and, uh, and others, uh, Guénon and various other people. But for now, I'm just going to keep it simple that we have this, const this what is essentially a breakdown of normalcy and traditional values. And it's expressed by uh, s what you would call in the West, what I call in a sort of derogatory term as libtards. And the whole libtard thing, that's, you know, the green haired, you know, woman with daddy issues and, you know, a ring through her nose, all of this mental illness stuff, okay, we have it here. So if you think that it doesn't exist here, it definitely exists here. But it's 30 years ago. OK, it's it's just the first shoots of it poking up through the through the grass. It's not it hasn't taken over and become a jungle like it has in the West. But are those things all here in, in embryon, embryonic form? Certainly they are. And so those types of people, especially among the young, the very young, the sort of 18, 19, 20, 21 sort of group, it's, it's not everybody, but they certainly exist there. The highly impressionable, the somewhat lost, that, you know, the lost generation, look, we have all those people here, and they're, they're like this because of social media. Okay, these are weak-minded people, and they're going to reproduce and all of that. So we, anyway, I'm going to get into that another time. But you have that, so you, therefore you have the solipsist uh, degenerate tendency here it's real um, and these people don't like Putin uh, what they want is they're just like solipsists in the West they want just more for them and everything to get better for no reasons that they could possibly understand because they don't make any effort okay but there is also people who a, the, a contingent who, of people who on my generation, I'm 55, so that this, you know, maybe maybe five or ten years either side of where I am, uh, in larger cities who are considered intellectual. You'd find them in Petersburg, uh, in Moscow, maybe one or two other places. Petersburg and Moscow, most particularly, who consider themselves intellectuals. And these people would be people who grew up, perhaps, you know, in the period where they were listening to people like De De De, or whatever it was, uh, Nautilus Pompilius, or you know Rosenbaum, or whoever it was, uh, Wysotsky, and they they're basically lib they're basically libtards of the kind of more of the John Lennon sort of sort of sort of type, and they're uh, more of the kind more of a kind of like the French intellectual kind of existential beard stroking sort of type of person. They exist. They definitely exist. They don't like Putin. Um, although uh, maybe maybe some of that's changed now, but certainly historically that would have been the case. So am I saying that you know Putin is beloved by every single person who lives in this country? No, of course he's not. Um, is he very popular? Yes, he is. Are things changing? Certainly they are. And what's happened in my experience here is that there's been a a wedge driven right the way through society, and it's it's broken for people in families, friends, whatever. People no longer talk to people that they previously talked to. In my experience of what I call the, the tarred contingent, I have a friend, I'm not going to get into the details of it, but she's somebody I've known for, for many years. And her son has run away to Armenia or somewhere. And I could feel that there was sort of difficulty regarding this subject. So I rang her up and I said, look, I'm just going to listen. I, um, I, I, I do have a view, but I want to listen to yours. I'm not going to interrupt you. I just want you to tell me everything you know, or you, you know, all of your opinions about this. Why, you, why you're so against this, you know, special military operation, etc. 
And uh, I was shocked. I was shocked because I was genuinely ready to, you know, sit and take notes for, for, for some time. Uh, she, she dried up after about 30 seconds. She had absolutely no facts whatsoever. And I just, I just, I, I found it amazing. I, I mean, her, her, her argument was, well, you know, if they have really not wanted to have a war, we could have stopped it. I, uh, and I, I just, you know, I said, is that it? Is that your argument? I couldn't believe how, how empty it was. And she said, well, yeah, that's basically it. Uh, it was all very, you know, full of pathos sort of Russian pathos as I said we like to suffer in this country but it, there was no substance to it so I just educated well I just gave her a kind of whirlwind tour of you know the Minsk agreements or you know the Maidan all of this stuff she didn't know any of it none of it absolutely none anyway so there you are but you you know to say that 100% of Russians all love Putin that's certainly not true so the, the thing is with the kind of the tarred contingent in my view is that they're making a very simple uh, error and that error is as follows, that they see that the, the choice is between uh, war in Ukraine, which is terrible, we all accept that, and no war in Ukraine. You know, but that isn't the choice. The choice is a war in Ukraine today or a war in the whole of Russia tomorrow. That, that's the choice. And unfortunately, life is difficult. And sometimes you have to make difficult choices. Well, here we are, we're making one. And that's what makes Putin a, great, a leader, a great leader. If you want to, if you like him, you don't like him, there's certainly, you know, let's say you didn't like Napoleon, you didn't like whoever it was. I'm not comparing, I'm not saying Putin and Napoleon are the same. I'm saying that there is a certain, uh, a certain luster that, uh, that, that attaches itself to a man who is able to make very difficult life and death decisions. And Putin certainly has those qualities. He certainly has those qualities. And there's nobody you can point to in the West who has those qualities, I'd say, other than Viktor Orban uh, in, in Europe, in, in what's called the collective West. The rest are total non-entities. And it's not being nasty. It's just an observation. I'm going to get into the reasons for that. There are reasons for that, but not now. So um, they think, as I say, there's a choice between war uh, in Ukraine and no war, but that's not the choice. That's a false choice. Um, so... Propaganda. I'm going to kind of wrap this up now. I've got a, a few points on propaganda that I want to make. Yes. So what I find in the Western presentation of Putin uh, is that it's all about projection, which is a new term that's entered the sort of uh, the commentariat. And it's, 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 a, it's, a, it's a great term because they do project. And because they are not able to win on the, on the basis of argument, because if you as I'll get into and may perhaps if I remember, but the way they do it, they, they think you're all thick, right? And, you know, it's it's a fair assumption given what's happened over the last, you know, 50, 100, 200 years. Because, you know, just, just in brief, what's going on now and uh, what's, what went on with the whole pandemic stuff, you know, people just sort of, oh, suddenly woke up and realised, oh, you know, this cattle, this cattle truck isn't going to a Club 30, you know, holiday. No, no, it isn't. No, it isn't. It's taking you to the abattoir. That's where it was always going. But it's been going there for a very long time, you see. And so, you know, all of this has a great long history that goes back a long, long time. It's not that things suddenly got bad. Things have been going where we are right now. We've been going for over 100 years. OK, they knew they knew this around the time of the First World War, maybe even earlier. This is a plan. OK, anyway. So the, the way that the propaganda works is they know that you're dumbed down. They know because they did it to you. They gave you the food. They gave you the education. They know you don't know anything. Um, they know that given the choice between sitting there and, you know, playing Minecraft or reading a book, you'll take Minecraft because Minecraft's easier. They know this. They, 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 they've, they've studied you. They've, they, they, they have sociology departments or, you know, whatever it is, sitting there working out how, how to manipulate you because you're the product, right? So that's how it works. You're the tax slave. That's how it works. And so they know that now you're too stupid to follow any kind of like difficult argument. And so what they do is they give you these um, feelings, they're trigger feelings. That's all it is. So Putin is kind of the bad daddy. OK, and and what they're going to do rather than engage in what Putin may or may not think is they're going to tell you what Putin is and then they're going to break that down. So what they'll do is they'll tell you that Putin thinks this or Putin wants this. Or he is this. This is based on nothing. This is based on projection. It's it's like throwing mud at a wall and some of it sticks. It's got nothing to do with anything. It's just there you are. They point, you know, they 
direct your attention to that wall. You throw they throw stuff, and and if they throw it enough, people, as you'll notice, if you go outside and try to talk to anybody, it's very difficult. But you will find that people are repeating these things that they they know nothing about themselves. They, they've never you know they've never listened to a Putin speech, but they have an opinion. Everyone's got an opinion. Um, I've never heard anybody in the West say, I just don't know anything about that particular subject. Everyone is an expert on absolutely everything. When did that happen? Anyway, to continue. But a simple lit litmus test for whether or not you're having your brains, you know, kind of expertly pummeled by people who do this for a living, and you are, is whether they're actually quoting him. How many actual quotes do you get in an article about Putin? Where is it that Putin says, ah, oh, yes, we're planning to invade you know, Ukraine on such and such a date, or we're planning this huge military push on such and such a date, or that we're going to do this on the anniversary of such and such a date. No, 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 no. You, you won't get any of that. What you'll get is a whole litany of stuff that they're telling you all about him. But you don't know any of that because you, you, you've never read anything that he said. So, or, or listen to it. And and that's partly Russia's fault. And I'll get into that in a, min, in, in a minute. Um, so what they'll do is, it's called, a, it's basically a straw man. So they set up the straw man and then they knock it down. But you, you, you've you never encountered the actual man. So a good litmus test for knowing whether or not you're being propagandized is basically is the television on. <laughs> That's a good one. But, you know, failing that one uh, is if they're talking about Putin, are they actually quoting him? You know, and more than two words. You know, they, they, they almost, almost, almost never do. So the tactic is to ascribe motives to him, which they then criticize ascribe goals to him which they then attack or ascribe timelines to him which they then say he's failed to meet but when did putin ever say any of these things you'll find never it's never happened okay and it, maybe this doesn't matter to you uh, maybe it doesn't matter to me but if you're concerned about world war three which is what we're actually living actually what we're actually living in is it's the end of world war two and what well, the beginning of world war three combined with a civil war and a tectonic shift in world politics. That's that's what we're living through. If you care about um, not being annihilated in, in a nuclear war, and I'm going to get into the relative merits of that another time, because actually I think this isn't like you know a, a cut and dried case, then you, you know you, perhaps you might take an interest in the person they're setting up as the reason for having this, because they personalise it, because they know that it's all to do with narratives. If you read somebody like Joseph Campbell, you know, the, the hero with a thousand faces. We have like these archetypes in our minds. And so rather than appeal to reason, because you haven't got one, you won't have one. If you've been to a British university or, you know, a Western university, if you have the, the ability to reason, it's, it's no thanks to the education that you got. They're training you not to have the ability f to reason. A hundred years ago, people could reason. If you look at even like a secondary school, <coughs> even um, a, a final exam from 1914, most of us couldn't do it. It required, you know, actual acumen and actual reason. We're so dumb now. I include myself in that. We're all degrading. We're all degrading. You have to fight it, fight it, fight it, fight it. Uh, I, I, I said, to, said to someone recently, I said, you know, we're all degrading. Me too. It's just, I'm just degrading just slightly slower than other people just because I make the effort. It's very difficult. So they know, they know. And they're degrading too. The elites are degrading too. This is, this is something I didn't fully appreciate is how really degraded they are because I, I i had assumed for a long time that they were much more intelligent than they really are they're greedy they're nasty they're vicious they're evil and they're very very determined but i think they're that bright okay so anyway i don't know why i got into that yes the reason why they do this is because they know you're too stupid to hold any kind of um re uh, logical reasoning argument in your mind uh, and they're right so the way that propaganda works is just they just keep they just keep repeating it and repeating it and repeating it. I mean they ascribe this to Hitler in uh, in Mein Kampf, but actually it's not true. He said he said the Jews do this. That's what he said. Uh, so he wasn't saying you should do it. He said that's that, that's what they do, and that's why it works, and that's what he did. So that that was actually the argument. It wasn't uh, this other thing that you know he was he was promoting it as as some sort of original idea. He was just taking it from somewhere else. <clears throat> All right, let's move on. Yeah, so to kind of get towards the end of this, if you want to know where Russia is, if you actually care about it, if it's something that interests you because you know you, you have, let's say you can't stop World War Three, but you have a passing interest in the fact that you're living in it, you should listen to the president of this country. 
okay? Because um, he will tell you what he thinks. This isn't Joe Biden. This isn't somebody who can't find the bathroom, doesn't know what day of the week it is. And, you know, if you asked him you know, without prior warning and notes, couldn't, couldn't tell you, you know, his name. This is somebody who can literally, whether you like Putin, you don't like Putin, you think he's the Antichrist, whatever it is, the fact is that he can stand up at a moment's notice without any preparation whatsoever and give a university level lecture on a whole range of subjects. So can Lavrov. There are quite a few very, very impressive people around here. Okay, am I saying all Russians are really impressive? No, no, I'm not. But there are some real leaders here. Whether you like them, you don't like them, whatever you think they're this, you think they're that. <sighs> they're not Kamala Harris. They're not that mourn in the UK um, uh, trust. Uh, they are, are are actually capable of 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 strategic, abstract, and practical thought. And, and and using those to reach attain solutions. I described the difference between some time ago when this first started, the difference between the West and, and Russia uh, as follows. I said that, and I stand by this, that the West is a, is a hysterical 13-year-old girl and Russia is a man with a gun. That, that's, that's where we are. And you need to understand that. We don't do trigger politics here. We don't care what your feelings are. It doesn't work that way, okay? This isn't a country of feelings, it's a country of facts. And, and if, if you want to know what Putin thinks about something, then I suggest that you listen to what he says. Now, the kind of person that man, uh, Putin will be decided to have been by history, uh, depending on who writes it, of course, <laughs> and depending on whether or not we have one, um, is, 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 you know, for a future time. Um, but one thing is certain is that the, the presentation of Putin in the West is cartoonish. It's ridiculous. It's, it's really ridiculous. And, of course, uh, Russia itself does an absolutely horrible job of PR, and it, it, it always has, and there are reasons for that as well. Uh, which perhaps not so interesting here. What, but in this regard, I would say that th the big mistake that the Russians make is when they're presenting Putin's speeches is to have the um, the, the translator or the uh, interpreter speaking over the top. So you've got you've got Putin in the background speaking this eloquent Russian, this highly reasoned uh, speech. Uh, in in excellent Russian, okay, or Lavrov, for example, and then over the top you've got, and so we want to explain to our Western partners. It's it's just ah oh, no, just take it away. It what they should do is translate it properly and put subtitles up, and then you can hear. You then you would hear, even though you don't understand the language. Let's say, you would hear behind, you would hear the cogency, the fluidity. Uh, the, the nuance and inflection of the language and then be able to read what it is he's actually saying. So the Russians are, you know, they're, they're fools to themselves. They're ghastly when it comes to their own public relations. They're really, really useless at it. Uh, what they do systematically is shoot themselves in the foot by confirming all of these pre-existing archetypes which have been driven into the into the mind of your average Westerner through James Bond films or, you know, whatever it is over... Over, over decades, over decades, and they just come along and confirm all of that with that ghastly Russian. I mean, there are some there are some nice Russian accents, but they they almost choose these archetype translators. You know, we would like to consider your requirements. You know, it's just oh, please go away. I mean, everyone's used to it now with TikTok and all of this stuff, where everybody people can't be expected to understand actual words. They have the the words flash up on the screen. Why not do that? Why not do that? Because these are some of the best speeches that have ever been made. I mean, there have been other good speeches too, but, you know, if you compare... <laughs> what's her name? That poor moron. Oh, crikey, she's so stupid. Um, Ursula van der Leyen. Yes. If you compare an Ursula van der Leyen's speech to a Putin's speech, you know, you'll have a, a very good diff a sense of, of what's wrong with the world. So, 
what you can do in in to 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 wrap this up i've talked a lot longer than i expected to um it's best to find if you are interested in what putin said you can find um official translations which will be very good probably on the websites i would imagine i don't use them because i listen to him you know in russian but i think tass t-a-s-s the TASS news agency, or maybe Ria Orvest, uh, Ria Novosti, uh, you'll probably find some kind of printout. I would, I wouldn't trust the, the Western translations because they, if, you know, a word can make a big difference or the choice of words. But, but if it's come from TASS or something like that, or maybe the Kremlin website or something like that, th those translations will have been will be correct, and you can read what he said, and then consider, and he will tell you, surprisingly. He'll tell you what the plan is. Because as going back to what I've said previously, this isn't how things that work in the West. It's 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 different here. We expect a leader to have a plan and we expect the, the leader to tell us what that plan is. We expect it. And Putin, you know, he's bound by those expectations because he's a politician. And as I say, he's a he's a moderate politician. He's not an extremist. So I'm sure I'm going to be attacked for as somebody who's a, a Putin apologist, a Putin troll. It's nothing to do with that. Really, it isn't. My my worldview is so far beyond this that it's not even it's not even worth talking about right now. But seeing as I live here, seeing as I speak the language, seeing as that this is my everyday reality. You know, I mean, I went out today to get you know this morning to get to get a. I, I drink cocoa now, I, sort of like a comfort drink. Went to a, a cafe to get a cocoa. You know, it's all in Russian. I'm talking to Russian people. I'm not, this is just my daily reality. And seeing as I'm here, and probably you're not, then I thought, well, this might be interesting to people. So that's why I'm sharing it. So anyway, that's that's those are my thoughts on it. And uh, I hope it's been of some help. And um, yeah, that's, that's all, all on this particular subject. So in closing, I currently upload to Odyssey, Rumble, YouTube, and Substack. So please like, share and subscribe on all platforms. It's free to do, but a valuable way of giving back. Go to samgerens.com and drop your email in the box to subscribe to my Substack newsletter and get all new content delivered to your inbox. I back up my mailing list so that if big tech cancels me, we still have options. I work outside the mainstream and have no corporate sponsorship. If you value what I do, you can help keep the lights on at samgerens.com slash contribute or upgrade to a paid subscription on my substack to access my more detailed work as well as comment substack being where i read all feedback i continue to make my legacy projects available free summaries and links are available at samgerens.com slash books finally i post news thoughts and announcements to my telegram channel at t.me slash samgerens thanks for listening and bye for now